Did you know that the US Navy lost over 80% of its size within just five years post-World War II? A force of 6,700 ships and 3.5 million sailors in 1945 was reduced to 634 active ships and just over half a million sailors by 1950. Of course, today, the United States has the most powerful navy on the planet with 11 active nuclear-powered supercarriers. But what caused the navy to almost starve to death in the 50s, resulting in the cancellation of the first supercarrier? And more importantly, what brought the navy back to life? President Harry Truman took office on April 12, 1945, after the death of President Roosevelt. When it came to spending on defense, Truman's thinking was that because the United States had nuclear weapons, that was enough to prevent any wars from happening, and if a war did break out, the United States had the biggest bomb, so there was no need to maintain a huge conventional military force. This way of thinking was in conflict with that of the first Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, which eventually led to President Truman replacing Forrestal with Lewis Johnson in 1949, who was a big supporter of Truman's approach to defense. In 1947, two years prior to Johnson's appointment as the new Secretary of Defense, the U.S. Air Force had just become an independent service, carved out of the U.S. Army, the Air Force was pushing to acquire the Convair B-36 strategic bombers, which could deliver nuclear bombs intercontinentally. At the same time, the U.S. Navy wanted to build a supercarrier, which could accommodate launching nuclear-capable bombers from its flight deck. So both the Air Force and the Navy were competing to secure funding, especially given the administration's cutbacks in the defense budget. But President Truman had already approved the construction of the first supercarrier, USS United States. What happened next would have been worthy of its own hashtag. On April 23, 1949, only five days after the supercarrier's keel had been laid, Secretary of Defense Johnson announced the cancellation of USS United States without prior consultation with the Department of Navy or Congress. Very concerned with this one-sided decision, the Secretary of the Navy, John Sullivan, immediately resigned. Congressional hearings commenced to better understand Johnson's snap decision on cancellation of the supercarrier, but ultimately the decision to sink the United States class of supercarriers was upheld, with the U.S. Air Force's B-36 strategic bombers being favored over the Navy's carriers for nuclear delivery missions. But the scandalous part was that Johnson, who cancelled the construction of the supercarrier, was a former board member of the Convair Corporation, the same company that was going to build the B-36 bombers for the Air Force. All this, as well as a number of other service rivalry and political factors, led to what is known as the Revolt of the Admirals, where a number of Navy's top brass resigned in protest. With the decision to go with the Air Force's B-36s and given the defense budget cuts, maintaining a big Army, Navy and Marine Corps did not make a lot of sense to Truman and Johnson. Johnson ordered nearly all of the Army inventories of surplus World War II tanks, communications equipment, personnel carriers and small arms to be scrapped or sold off to other countries instead of being shipped to ordnance and storage depots for reconditioning and storage. Truman and Johnson pushed for the unification of the forces, which basically meant the abolishment of the Marine Corps. As for the Navy, ships, landing craft, and equipment needed for conventional force readiness was mothballed from the fleet for lack of operating funds. The United States Navy and Marine Corps, once the world's preeminent amphibious force, lost most of their amphibious capabilities, which were scrapped or sold as surplus. But what President Truman and Secretary of Defense Johnson did not know was that their defense policy was going to be put through a harsh test very soon. And what followed was not what they thought. On June 25, 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea, a war that would go on for three years 
during which China and the Soviet Union backed North Korea and South Korea was supported by the United Nations, but 90% of the military personnel came from the United States. As an initial response to the invasion, President Truman called for a naval blockade of North Korea, but was shocked to learn that such a blockade was not practically possible since the US Navy no longer had the warships needed for this operation. In addition, the initial onslaught by North Korean forces had destroyed the majority of Air Force bases in South Korea. Air Force bases in Japan were too far away to permit the loiter time needed for close air support missions. So the US Air Force had no base near the action to fight back from. The Air Force, with its heavy emphasis on strategic bombing, had neglected attack missions and close air support. As a result, all air support during those early disastrous months came from USS Valley Forge, the only aircraft carrier left in the Western Pacific when South Korea was invaded. Valley Forge was soon joined by the other two aircraft carriers remaining in the Pacific. The mess that the United States found itself in was a direct result of the recent defense policies. Concerned about public criticism of his handling of the Korean War, President Truman decided to ask for Johnson's resignation. Lewis Johnson resigned in September of 1950, only three months after the Korean War had begun. Despite lacking resources, the US Navy made do by recalling thousands of officers from the reserve force. President Truman himself formally addressed the reservists. We face a serious situation. We hope we face it in the cause of peace. During the Korean War, the Navy had to recommission ships, modernize aircraft carriers, and develop better airplanes. Korea was a peninsula, so control of the air and seas was essential for victory on land. Interestingly enough, the B-36 strategic bombers were never employed in combat during the Korean War. The fighting finally came to an end on July 27, 1953, when the Korean Armistice Agreement was signed. But the end of the Korean War was just the beginning of a new era for American naval aviation. The US Navy's actions during the Korean War demonstrated the effectiveness of aircraft carriers in the age of jet aircraft. One of the greatest advantages of aircraft carriers is that by sailing in international waters, they do not interfere with any territorial sovereignty, which eliminates the need for overflight authorizations from third-party countries, reduces the times and transit distances of aircraft, and therefore significantly increases aircraft availability in the combat zone wherever that may be around the globe. These advantages became so obvious during the Korean War that even one year prior to the end of the war, the keel of a new supercarrier, USS Forrestal, was laid. USS Forrestal joined the fleet three years later. With British developments in flight deck technology, which was adopted and applied to older carriers like USS Midway, more powerful jets were now viable at sea. Swept wings and supersonic speed brought carrier aviation into the forefront of combat flying by the end of the decade. The Korean War was costly, and the mass activation of the reserves disrupted many lives. But the lessons learned in preparedness and carrier effectiveness sustained America's overseas military efforts for the remainder of the Cold War and to this day. Which may also be the day that you get a personalized thank you card from Not What You Think. See description for more details.